disruptors and curious minds, welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club, where every week Jeremy and I go deep, serious, immersive, extravagant into the chapter of a book. Why do we do this, Jeremy? I do it because I find I can understand what's happening in these pages better by, you know, pushing up against what you're thinking on this stuff uh, to land on, you know, a new, new awareness of it. It's, it's really kind of fun, man. I like reading. I like reading by myself. It's kind of, it's cool, but like this next step has, has been fun. And um, you know, hopefully it's fun for the folks listening as well. Yeah. Read together, think together, expand together, progress together. If that sounds like something, click subscribe, click like, tell your reading friends and come and join us. Um, this week, chapter six of the design of everyday things by Don Norman, the, the preeminent mind on design. This guy has been, he has consulted it. I, I don't want to say NASA, but I think NASA, but literally every single big Fortune 500 company in the world, if they have a design problem, this is the man they call. So well, I tell you what, he was on in this chapter, he talks about his, uh, you know, 35 year engagement trying to figure out the standardization of high definition television. So yeah. <laughs> if someone can rely on him for 35 years, I guess there's there's something to what he what he's doing. Um, what what um, what jumped out to in to you initially and in just high level, like what themes excited you about about chapter six? And this is design thinking. It's a term that everyone is is well aware of these days. Right. Um, but, you know, back in what, 1985, when this was originally written, probably a new concept. So, yep. um, yeah. Talk to me. What are you thinking? Well, the first thing that stood out to me on chapter six was actually another book that we read in the book club, The Nexus, The New Convergence of Art, Technology and Science by Julio Tino, which was the first book we read. And that was all about creativity, divergent and convergent thinking. And it would appear probably unsurprisingly that there is a, a link between great creativity and great design. And that lies in the how you think about the problems and the solutions of design and not diverging too quickly on your ideas by extrapolating ideas, asking questions. On At the beginning, he says, one of my rules is in consulting is simple. Never solve the problem I'm asked to solve. Why such a counterintuitive rule? Because invariably, the problem I'm asked to solve is not the real fundamental root problem. It's usually just a symptom. In design, the secret of success is to understand what the real problem is. And then, you know, you get to that by our friend Divergent Thinking and Man, Creativity. I <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, this was really interesting. Never solve the problem you are assigned to sell. So, or assigned to solve, rather. Or and, sell. Yeah. Or sell, right? So this is really interesting. Um, you know, obviously take this with a grain of salt because, you know, if you're paid to solve a problem, you know, you uh, you want to make sure you're somewhat directed in 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 helping that customer figure out what what they want to have happen. But more often than not, the problem that they're asking you to solve is not the real one. It's not the root cause. And and yeah. you know, egos get in the way of this, right? So, you know, if you hire me, you say, "Hey, Mark, my company's de or Hey, Jeremy, my company's dealing with X, Y, Z. I need you to figure out why this is going on." You know, and I start thinking, I'm like, well you know, Mark, your department is, is the root cause of this thing, right? So you're not going to say you're the root cause of it, but there's a, there's a gentle way to, uh, um, I don't know, dial down the ego a little bit. It's, it's, it's a difficult process, but yeah, yeah. It can be a superpower defining the problem and delivering the news of the problem defined. And he speaks about the importance of interdisciplinary thinking and teamwork to root out those problems of that you're trying to solve um he there's a nice diagram here for those who are watching on youtube of the the what they call in design the uh, catchy this one the double diamond model of design um and essentially you have the problem you use divergent thinking to ask all the 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 questions then you converge on what you believe the problem is. And then you do the same thing with the solution and use that to <laughs> create good design. 
Yeah, what I what I looked at this as is a, is a really um, you know simply laid out uh, explanation of the cycles of divergence and convergence, right? And and how those how those two have to work together. And and you know we talked about this a ton. Society is very driven uh, from a convergent mindset or a convergent thinking mindset. And not to allow divergent thinking to go on for too long, because guess what else we have with almost nearly everything we do? We have a budget and we have a schedule. Um, so, you know, balancing those is, is critical. One thing I thought was kind of fun that jumped out to me was, um, you know, nothing like nothing like an impending deadline to force the convergence button. <laughs> Uh, well, we uh, spoke about that with Falling Water and uh, Thingy Wright, didn't we, in the last book, and how he, he was pushed by his deadline. And, you know, you're a writer, I'm a writer. I was just like, You've got two hours. Okay, we better get this done. Well, and how often do you, I mean, I, I had, a, had a presentation that I was doing um, at, at a university here last Friday. And, you know, it's rooted in work I've done for years. But I waited until like nearly the day before to figure out what I was going to do. And there, there was that moment of like, oh, my God. I got to figure this out. And then like 10 minutes later, I was on the road to doing it, but I waited. Uh, I waited quite a long time. Um, I'm sh there's definitely some creative juice that flows from procrastination. Yeah, I'm a, a believing that. And um, I want to touch on, there's a two, couple of things which stood out to me. Um, perhaps I'll start with the, the nice one. So, he speaks about effective design. What you think he says? Effective design needs to satisfy a large number of constraints and concerns. Shape, form, cost, efficiency, reliability, effectiveness, understandability, usability, the pleasure of appearance, the pride of ownership. But it was the last one which I resonated with the most. And, I've, and I have brought one good design thing with me. I've got a prop. You'll know what this is. Ooh, the Wawa pedal. So this is a Vox Wawa pedal, and it's the, the, one of the the three things in the world that objects that I really like. Um, and the last constraint is the joy of actual use. And he talks about mm. designing for joy, like the. And I was thinking about all the things that I like in terms of products. And I like them because I like using them. I don't care about cost. I don't care about so much about appearance, although that does play a role. The, vis the visceral design of it, which we spoke about the other week. But yeah, they're just a joy to use. My guitar, my wah wah pedal, my snowboard, like my phone. Like I enjoy using these things. And he talks about, um, how, how does he call it? Like actionable? actionable design or something and yeah ba basically designing your products around the joy that they bring and yeah like and that. not and not just the pure are they solving this problem check yes or no i mean that's products have to <laughs> kind of solve problems but man like what was the problem for a wah wah pedal i need my guitar to go wah 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 <laughs> yeah i mean you know the problem that i was solving when i bought mine was like oh now i can now i can play voodoo child like you know the <laughs> little intro to voodoo child i feel good about that now so that was solving that need but um yeah, super interesting that that that, that how often does joy um, become an evaluation mechanic for good design, and how do you capture that? So here's that translates into something that I that I wrote down here too. Um, the applied ethnography, I think, was was the right was the kind of the the research methodology that is used to understand life as kind of a social phenomenon, right? Uh, which is kind of a big thing. Like, why do we do what we do? Uh, the cultural, the political, the economic reasons for doing those things. But more importantly, this is where uh, in order for research to be used, the, the word applied ethnography means, hey, there's going to be something useful out of it to apply to product development. So how do they turn qualitative data, like understanding the social phenomenon that is life into quantitative information? that you can use to make a decision? Don't ask me that question. Can you answer that question for yourself? I, I don't know that I can. I mean, sh I, I did a quick search and, and it talked about using ways to tag information like that with a 
you know, like a confidence score. Like I believe this because uh, of this data on a 97% confidence score, but again, still very subjective rather than, rather than objective. But that kind of study is, is largely subjective. Okay. And how do you turn subjective data into actionable design? But didn't you work with with kind of subjective data in the the, the call centers in the oh as far as data center stuff goes yeah that was really not, not so much i mean the only the only what well, did you say did i work with objective or subjective uh, subjective okay yeah so on or off is very uh objective right and the systems that we designed are the power systems that uh, stay online if certain things happen. And there's the, there's a, there's a, um, there's kind of a balance lever that says, you know, the more reliable your systems are, uh, the more expensive they are. Cause you have to buy instead of one of them, you have to buy in some cases, 1.5 of them or two of them. Right. So if one goes down, this is like a UPS system that helps keep the power up in between electrical outages. Right. And then generators too, is another one. But if one goes down, the other one's up and, and the, there's no, there's no like, well, what was the, what was, how did the generator feel when it went down? Like there was no, there was no bit of that. So it was very, that was easier and directed, but like building an app that, uh, that is an interface for, you know, artists and fans to use music together in different ways, very subjective kind of stuff, right. With what artists want, with what fans want, what the experience needs to be. Um, so I don't know, I, I've, I've got that earmarked as like, how do you turn qualitative information into quantifiable data? I think that would be a good thing to learn and understand, even though we don't know it now. Yeah, I think it would very profitable use of your time. Um, <laughs> let me know how you get on. <laughs> yeah, we'll do another episode on that. Um, so the uh, the human centered design process he talks about the four activities observation idea generation prototyping and testing i don't want to spend too much time on those i thought observation was the one that was most interesting to me um yeah the observing different cultures again we're back to this people and culture aren't we and that's quite interesting for us so how you you know teenagers in japan are different to teenagers in in england and then 18 year olds are different to 16 year olds and it, it, this is cross-cultural mass change and how you have to observe it's almost like observing your target in their natural environment which i thought was quite interesting yeah i think of it, think of it as like you know um i don't know there's like a little bit of like uh uh, I don't know what the right word is, but like there's the proactive nature of of having this team of design researchers, right? And it's like this A team. I don't know if you remember the A team that show that was. Do I remember the A team? Uh, hey, I'm just having a crack commando unit escape from a high security prison. Okay, okay. I just to the Los Angeles so, yeah. underground today. All right, so there's definitely not a uh, a U.S. and a European disconnect on A team references. So that's good. Yeah. Oh, no, but you have these people out there in your desired audience demographic constantly. Like they're always deployed. So when like new products come up or a guy's like, hey, this new technology comes up, you know, we want to build this, this or that. Instead of the product team saying no to deploying a design research team for five weeks, you know, because, you know, we can't do that because we can't meet schedule. I don't have budget for that. It's moving too fast. You do it all the time. If you're doing it all the time, there's that constant communication channel between what people really want and understanding what they will buy together. I, I think um, I just brought up your applied ethnography again, which I didn't really <laughs> link those two things. <laughs> oh, well, repeat it. Um, have you ever any experience, and I think that in our some of our long format interviews will answer this question so on a thursday if you're just reading the book club or watching the book club we interview um people at the cutting edge of emerging technology and culture and we speak about immersive experiences a lot in the metaverse and how technology can um make 
expensive manufacturing, it cut costs in manufacturing, etc. And one of the, the Wizard of Oz um, method of prototyping, which I hadn't heard of it been referred to as the Wizard of Oz prototyping. Had you come across that before? No, I haven't, but I thought it was really interesting. It's funny you mentioned that. That was the next thing on my list that I wanted to talk about is like mocking the automated behavior of something with actual humans, with that you know, reservation system that that Norman talked about uh, testing. Yeah, and uh, like my mumbled attempt at trying to explain what our other show is about is kind of using digital twins and virtual worlds to the same effect to essentially mm-hmm. create manufacturing plants or create the end. I mean, he explains it. I don't really see why it's called the Wizard of Oz technique, but essentially imagining the end result and then almost like reverse engineering your challenges and solutions to that imagined end goal. To, to me, I got the Wizard of Oz thing being, you know, if you're, we're, you're testing this reservation system that he references and you sit down at a console and you're typing in, you know, you want to search for a trip to Kansas and you're trying to figure out all of that stuff. They're collecting data on how what you want to understand how you want to use a tool like that, how that would be most valuable by, by capturing your questions. But the response that you got seemed automated, seemed like you were testing this tool, but I was on the other side as a human answering the questions, right? So it seemed like a system where it was just a human mocking the future potential of that system, which I think is really interesting. I bet a lot of people are thinking about how to do that with, with AI technologies you know having humans on the other side before the language models created testing it with real human interaction to figure out what the end result should be yeah i like that what the end result should be not what the end result <laughs> so testing prototypes this was interesting too uh i pulled out the nugget of using pairs uh to have people test experiences instead of doing it instead of making hey mark test this thing out for me Instead, uh, you know, a company would be like, hey, Mark and Jeremy, you guys play around with this thing together. And it's similar to you and I reading a book together and talking about a book together. Um, I think we're able to dig in a little deeper. And similarly, if people are paired together to test something, they're more willing to kind of push the boundaries on it together. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I think that was another one of those things where two is a good number and then as soon as you add more people in it that doesn't work so two is better than one but four is not necessarily better than two yep yep but five groups five groups or five pairs you know the study five people is kind of interesting too that that seems to be a number that gets you a good amount of information without overwhelming you so study five according to what his collaborator uh norman's collaborator said in this chapter and then you iterate and you tweak and then you study five more and iterate and tweak and and before for long you have a pretty nimble process to get to where you need to be right yep great word nimble you should use that word more often yeah nimble is a good word <laughs> um, we have to be nimble like we like we're nimble like companies and people and freelancers like nimble is what things have to be these days that's the new facebook thing like move quickly and break things is actually no yeah be nimble mhm mhm um one more thing i'll be nimble with this the um it's about um tasks and activities so he speaks about design tasks and activities essentially if you're designing ux people have tasks they want to do and they want to have activities they want to achieve um he talks about the psychology of this um the american psychologist charles carver and michael schneider suggest that goals have three fundamental levels that control activities B b goals um so at the most abstract level and given a person's being, they determine why a person acts. Um, the do goal, which is more akin to the goal of, you know, what the activities want to perform and motor goals, which specifies just how the actions are performed. So if you're designing a website or an app, then you want to have that level of priority in mind, be goals, do goals and motor goals and stack it accordingly. Basically, yep. people are just only obsessed with themselves. They don't care about anything else. Right. That's right. That's right. And these hierarchies are really interesting because I automatically be thinking, I always think about uh, customer journeys, right? And these journey yeah. maps that you can sketch out. And I, I worked with, you know, one one company that I recall, I worked with Orange Theory Fitness and you know, worked with them for years on 
how to um, how to be more intentional about how they partner with music, how they use music in the gyms, how they use music to um, drive brand goals and that sort of thing. And one thing we ended up looking at that was really interesting is like the the Orange Theory member journey from when kind of they wake up in the morning right before they go to the gym, right after they go to the gym, when they start thinking about going to the gym the next day. And then how does music meet those moments uh, throughout the day? So like that's within these activities, these high level activities, these lower level activities, these tasks, uh, I automatically think of user journey with that. With that, just on a, on a side one, I, I go to the gym, but I don't really do the collective classes so much. It's more than just, you know, and everyone wears headphones. So music of the gym don't, doesn't really change anything. But in those collective classes where people aren't wearing headphones, then the music is very useful for defining the mood. and the, the Scientifically the proven to be useful yeah. too. I, I, I nerded out on that for like, two or three years where there's two things not to go on a rabbit hole, but two things, uh, one's called entrainment. Uh, and it's why, why we march to rhythm. It's why we bounce our feet when we hear music. Right. And then there's also this concept called dissociation, which is like when you're thinking about uh, a song where you're in, when the song's playing while you're working out, you know, let's say I have the tiger, right. And you're yeah. trying to do a hundred pushups and you get to 20 and you want to give up something in that music pulls you to another place to let you get the task done. I'll, I'll counter that with something I was listening to, which um, was saying that when you're, when you're doing sport, it's not always good to have extra sensory input, podcasts or music, because you're being stimulated by the music. You're being stimulated by the podcast and you're, trying, you're stimulated by the workout. And in fact, the st- having too much mental stimulation with your physical stimulation, which is also causing mental stimulation, isn't always, and I, I obviously I, I haven't read this in enough detail to give you the facts, but isn't necessarily the best way to get optimal workout all the time. Something to think about. 100%. Yeah. So let's, let, I, I want to hit a couple more things before, before we wrap this. And, um, one, one was, uh, one was a sentence that I underlined, you know, how can, how can one person move across so many disciplines and this, you know, rings, you know, rings true for everything I do. And a lot of the things that you do as well, Nexus call back to Nexus again, um, kind of validating in a way, but you know, the way I think about that too, is you know making something from nothing no matter what it is is a similar process there's a similar process it just has different inputs and different outputs and you if you can generalize a process of making something from nothing i think you can live across multiple disciplines you're gonna have to explain that a bit more for me so when making something from nothing we made you know thinking on paper from nothing you know, made book club from nothing, right? The process of organizing the idea to do that, testing the idea, um, getting validation, getting information, iterating, scaling, all of that can be applied to anything that you do, right? Okay, yeah. So I think that's how people can live across disciplines is by understanding making something from nothing. I like that. Okay. So that's why we're doing the book club because I would never have thought of that. And then I didn't really follow what you were saying. So you repeated it and now I get it. And yeah, I, I agree. Creating something from nothing. Um, so I was thinking of magicians and things. Um, oh, look. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put a downer on things because everything we've spoken womp, about the last like womp. five episodes of book club it's all about great design and yeah you've got a, all these systems and all these frameworks and all these ideas and all these mental models and all these things that you can designers and brands and companies can do to make our lives better and to make the gadgets and the experiences that we have better more more human la 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 in fact um <laughs> what did he say um the eight but the reality of life within a business often forces people to behave quite differently from that ideal. One disenchanted member of the design team for a consumer products company told me that although his company professes to believe in user experience and to follow human-centered design and everything we've spoken about for the last five weeks or however long it has been, in practice, there are only two drivers of new products. Number one, adding features to match the competition. And number two, adding some feature driven by new technology. 
technology for the sake of technology and keeping up with the Joneses. And that overrides everything for 90% of businesses and brands building shit, doesn't it? It, it requires a certain amount of um, courage, I think, to to be the person in that room to say, look, are we doing this the right way? And, you know, if we look, you, you always have to ground this new concept and new ideas, nexus and grounding and all of that we talked about in previous episodes, but grounding it in, okay, has this stuff been working? And if, the, if, if working just means, hey, we're hitting, we're hitting sales goals, we're hitting profitability goals, then as a designer, you might have, you might have to look at that and go, well, hey, I'm not going to affect change in this organization. I need to find a new organization that's going to do things by human centered design. And dare we say life centered design, which is a, the extension of, of this methodology that we'll hopefully get into in the future. Yeah. Joy centered design. Joy awesome. centered design. I love if it. You, Chapter love six. It. Chapter six. If you like what you're listening to, click subscribe, click like, tell your friends who love books and come join us. Because Jeremy, we've nearly finished that book, which means, what does it mean? We're on to the next one. I actually have mine ordered. It hasn't landed yet. It should be getting here. Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. This guy has been um, collecting and interconnecting um, previous mental models, thought methodologies, knowledge building strategies. Um, I've been following him for a while. I know Mark has. I haven't read his book. I look forward to it. This is going to be really good. So talk about augmenting your thinking. Talk about sharpening your thinking skills. Uh, this will be one you don't want to miss. Yeah. So we're going to record the first one of those on the 5th of March. Um, maybe even a week before that. No, yeah, 5th of March. Um, and then we'll release it the following week. So if you want to buy this book and join us, you have another two weeks to get involved. Um comment below and we'll send you more details and all of that yeah clear thinking shane Parrish, next book and then you can appear in uh in one of these boxes over here yeah. and talk with us live it'll be fun it's gonna be fun all right well hey stay curious be disruptive keep thinking on paper